Welcome to the first webinar of the Think Wider webinar series for 2022, New Perspectives on Development. I'm Kunalson, the director of Community Wider. The Wider webinar series features a lineup of eminent researchers and development specialists who present their work and discuss new perspectives on the topic of global development. The title of today's webinar is Why Urban Poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa Needs More Attention. The challenges facing urban economies in Sub-Saharan Africa are considerable. Yet it can be argued that development economics, which is a well-established field as we know, hasn't really paid enough attention to urban economies in the global south. So it's quite clear that it's very, it's very, very clear that we need to understand better what's happening to urban economies in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially through the lens of economics. And it's also widely accepted that urban areas are rife with inadequate livelihood opportunities and considerable poverty. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of those working in the urban economy, especially those who are in the informal sectors of the urban economies, with unaffordable and unavailable essential services, as well as lockdowns that have prevented the mobility that is essential for economic activities. But while the additional costs incurred by both houses and companies through in inadequate public service provision are now recognized, improvements have not been delivered. As such, increase in productivity also remains a huge challenge for urban economies. I'm pleased to welcome Diana Mitlin, who will present today's webinar on this very specific topic, why urban poverty in Southern Africa needs more attention. Diana is Professor of Global Urbanism at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. Since 2020, she has been CEO of the African Cities Research Consortium, a six-year program funded by FCDO, which seeks to generate new insights and approaches to tackle complex problems in Africa's rapidly changing cities and enable them to become more productive, equitable, and inclusive. I'm pleased to say that UNE Wider is a core partner of the African Cities Research Consortium, leading on the domain of structural transformation. Diana's work focuses on urban poverty and inequality, including urban poverty reduction programs and the contribution of collective action by low income and otherwise disadvantaged groups. She had a particular research focus on issues of urban basic services, tenure, and housing. She studied urban social movements and the strategies of confrontation and collaboration with state agencies. Some of Diana's earlier work has been brought together in two co authored volumes with David Satterwith Urban Poverty, the Global South, Scale and Nature, published in 2013, and Reducing Urban Poverty in the Global South, published in 2014. Diana is unusual as a scholar because she does not believe in living in the ivory tower academia as many of us do and works extensively with civil society organizations. For the last 20 years, Diana's worked closely with the Shack Slum Dwellers International, a transnational network of homeless and landless peoples, federations, and support NGOs, and with the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, a network of civil society groups focusing on urban poverty and exclusion. We're really privileged to have Diana present in today's webinar. We're also pleased to have a colleague from Uni Wider as I discuss it. Michael Danpa is a development economist and a research fellow at UNE Wider. Michael serves as the core focal point for the UNE Wider project, Transforming Informal Work and Livelihoods, which is very much about the kind of issues that Diana will speak about on informality, especially in urban areas in Africa. And he's also part of the Wider's team for the African Cities Research Program. So thanks again to Michael for being a discussant for today's webinar. Now to a few logistical issues. First, please type in your questions using the Q&A feature that you see on your screen. I will read out your questions on your behalf and sometimes also allow to speak, uh, to ask the questions uh, also directly to Diana and Michael. The webinar will be recorded and shared later on our YouTube channel afterwards. Now, I would like to hand over the, the flow to Diana and Diana over to you, 20 minutes, please. Thanks very much. So oh, thank you so much, Kunal. I trust you can hear me okay. Yeah? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay, perfect. So thank you for the introduction. I'm really honored to be the first presenting this first seminar of the year 2022. 
And thanks for such an amazing introduction. As you said, I'm now working as CEO of the African Cities Research Consortium, and I'm absolutely delighted to have you and you wider as consortium partners, in part because I can see that you have really been taking on the challenge of chipping away at the work that needs to be done on urban economies. So congratulations from your work to date. Hopefully we can draw you into new and exciting work. I think the only thing I would add to your introduction is that I am um, uh, that I have some connection to economics perhaps, although my work now is much more on the social side and is very multidisciplinary. My first degree for the audience was in sociology and economics and I worked for five years for the British government as a public sector economist, and I did a master's in straight economics. So unlike many of my colleagues in the non-economic social sciences, I am perhaps more excited than frustrated at the potential of economics. I think the economics discipline has a critical contribution to make. And I really appreciate the chance to, to present to this audience, this wider audience that UNU wider has drawn together. So I think the sub, um, let me just make sure I don't get distracted by the, the screen. So I think the subtitle really is why urban poverty in sub-Saharan Africa needs more attention from economists. And I'm going to share with you some challenges that myself and my colleagues have, have, have lived, have lived. We are anxious to draw in an economics audience inside you and you wider and beyond you and you wider. And I'm going to make four reflections today. To be frank, I don't think they necessarily um, encapsulate all the challenges I would wish to throw at economists, but I have a 20 minute, uh, I have a 20 minute time limit. So the first challenge is a methodological challenge, and I want to share my frustration with poverty measurement. The second one is not so much an economist, economist challenge, it's a definitional challenge that deals particularly with sanitation, but it, it again shares with you some of the potentials of the economics discipline if it deepens and broadens and um, catalyzes a deeper engagement with the urban economies and beyond the urban economies. The third challenge is a challenge of discipline boundaries and what economists can offer and where more collaborative work is needed. And the final challenge is an empirical challenge and I'll come to that. So looking at the first challenge, the poverty measurement challenge, perhaps, Inevitably, in a context in which poverty has been understood primarily as rural poverty, we have ended up with a poverty measurement process that I would argue, and my colleague David Satterthwaite, who co-authored the books Canal you mentioned, would also argue, this draws a lot on his work, that we need to rethink poverty measurement. Typically, a poverty line is what it costs to buy a basket of goods. So the non-food element is residual. Now, for those living in relatively low dense rural contexts where people don't have to pay for, for, for housing, don't have to pay for water and sanitation, probably don't pay for transport, um, this might be adequate. But as you move into an urban context, this is uh, 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 on the periphery of Jinja in Uganda, as you move into an urban context, the non-food element is, is relevant. And there are three elements, I would argue, to that non-food element. And economists have struggled to deal with this. There is, of course, an argument in the literature that says what I'm talking about now is not significant. But the body of urban scholars struggle to understand its lack of significance. So one problem that I would say economists don't deal, I mean, they deal with well, is, is the fact that prices are different in urban areas. That's not such a difficult challenge for economists. But you need to include that if you're doing a rigorous poverty assessment. And it's not always well included. I would say that too. A second challenge is that um, there are goods that are commodified in the urban context that are not commodified in the rural context. So you see here this illustration, people are having to, to, to rent rooms, probably. Probably many of these people rent, some may build, but that is a real cost. It's a cost that may not be incurred from housing in rural areas. They have to buy services, they have to buy water, sanitation. In this case also, they almost certainly have to buy transport because there's some distance from the center. Those are very significant costs. Transport for those living in peri-urban areas when you break down household expenditures, maybe 10% of the budget. So this is not small. And they are also a third issue in addition to adjusting correctly for prices and adjusting for the fact that there are these very significant non-food costs. The third issue is that in some cases, 
quality has to be higher because of the complication of density and in some cases urban livelihoods so domestic servants for example may actually have to spend on money on a fair amount of money on clothes to look suitable for the work they do so there is a real possibility that some some of the uh, figures that suggest that urban poverty is not considerable. Some of that is the fact we're not using appropriate methodologies. And as real wages are just to take account of the fact that these costs have to be higher, but they don't translate into reduced poverty or well-being, they are, they are actually misleading. This transition can be misleading and we may be misleading ourselves for the urban poverty figures. So the first challenge is to think in much greater detail about what it costs to live in urban areas and what might be in a more appropriate methodology. I'm not going to try and go through this because I'm going to run out of time, but I was very struck looking at UNUIDA's work at this working paper, Improving Women's Working Conditions in the Tanzania Urban Food Vending Sector, which deals a lot with employees who are selling food. And as I, this quote shows, their salary is not sufficient to cover house rent, utilities, school expenditures, health costs and savings for unforeseen expenses deducting transport costs, rent, you, you have a feel, you have a feel for this reality. So this is one area I think that, that um, I'm kind of calling on economists to be more creative about. Let me go on to a second area, a kind of definitional challenge. And as I said, this is not so much economists definitions, but it, it, it really shows the complexity of what urban economics needs to deal with if it's going to be uh, successful in really adding value to addressing the challenges in the urban context. So uh, for many years, the joint monitoring program of WHO and UNICEF, who, who are the key agency reporting on water and sanitation, have considered sanitation primarily as a toilet. Again, this is heavily influenced by rural contexts. And they're only really catching up very slowly with the challenge of fecal sludge management. The fact that you cannot just consider a toilet why can you not just consider a toilet? This is a, 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 a toilet from um, Blantyre in Malawi. This is uh, what's called a skylu, so it's on-site sanitation. It collects the, the waste matter in, in two chambers underneath the toilet, but it assumes that it has relatively low use because each chamber takes four months to decompose. You use one chamber, you then switch to the second chamber, and while you are carrying on with your business, you make compost or the, the chamber decomposes. But of course, if there are too many people using it, you have to empty this toilet. You can see, I think, from this slide, some of the houses in the near vicinity. This toilet was one of very few, which is why it's so well badged. So in this kind of context, you cannot rely on on-site sanitation. You are moving fecal sludge, and that is a whole different complication. So, and this draws on some work that I was doing with the World Resources Institute to really look at the challenge in the context of sustainable and equitable cities in the urban context, even if you live in a shack, not a medium rise building, and the shack is dense in a dense area, you have to collect the fecal sludge, you have to move the fecal sludge, you have to treat the fecal sludge, and you have to dispose of it safely. And that challenge, that challenge is rarely taken account of when you look at figures for sanitation. So the JMP, for example, uh, reported that, where's this figure? Oh, give me one moment. The JMP reported actually that 100% of urban dwellers have access to basic sanitation. Basic sanitation in their context is a toilet, is a pit latrine, poor flush, potentially, but rarely in urban Africa, connected to a sewer, potentially a septic tank. It, 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 it's a, a toilet where you do not have the problem of moving fecal sludge in this way. To have improved sanitation facilities, you need to, to, you need to have safely managed sanitation facilities, you need to move the fecal sludge. So not only do you need access to a toilet, a basic sanitation facility, you, need, you also need to move it. And that is where the figures look much less good. So if 99% have basic sanitation, an estimated 30% of the urban population in Africa have sanitation that is safely disposed of in situ, and to be frank, I query that figure. 
and 0%, which essentially means they don't know. They don't know how much fecal sludge is safely managed. So if we're going to successfully address the challenge of sanitation, we have got to address the challenge of what it means to move fecal sludge. Let me just go through one more complication that is rarely considered in, in much of the work on sanitation, but will be, I think, have a sympathetic audience um, when, I, when I'm dealing with economists. And that is, you know, the, the JNP optimistically assumed that 99% of Africa's urban population have basic sanitation access toilets that, that may not move fecal sludge, but they somehow, uh, uh, you know, they're in, in place. Now, that assumes that everyone more or less has access to a toilet, but we know that over two thirds, well, almost two thirds of the African population is living in slum or informal settlements, so-called slums. Now, many of those people buy sanitation. If you buy sanitation, you have short calls and long calls. If you pay five cents to use the toilet, you use the toilet four times a day, you have five members of your family, you're paying a dollar a day in sanitation. And of course, you're not going to pay a dollar a day in sanitation. Sanitation is simply not an affordable expense for many of these households. And that is also where you incur problems of managing fetal sludge. So the whole issue of sanitation has touched some economists, but there is, I would argue, need for a much more creative engagement. In this case, probably between both, um, oops, between both economists and engineers, as well as uh, social scientists to understand the challenges. Now, this, fi fi this, this point where I ended up in sanitation in saying that economists need to work closely with health specialists and engineers is, is in a sense my third challenge. And that is a boundary challenge. And that is to really understand the, the urban economic challenges. Of course, we need to deal with the political economy. And, and Crinnell, this is, I think, where your work it, it has, has dealt with some of these issues and the work of some of your colleagues. So land, land is in a sense, urban gold, no? Land that is well connected, that is well serviced, that is well located. Um, is absolutely what the urban story is all about. The advantages of agglomeration, the potential to really start to add value and, and in adding value, creating a surplus that can be an elite good or can be put to the value of all. So land is worth a huge amount. And, um, but one of the challenges as is I think widely recognized is that in order to understand land, you need to understand political economy and you need to really engage with the way in which land provides um, flows of asset, flows of resources to a political elite. This picture is from Nairobi, it's a tenement block. Um, and, and you know, this, this in a sense uh, illustrates the conundrum, one of the conundrums of, of the urban economy. So you go around these blocks and someone will, will, will share with me which member of the elite owns which block. But actually, of course, that's not public knowledge in a sense, because that's that's um, not formally owned. This is, a, this is an area that is partly informal. It contravenes building regulations, partly formal. It has police stations and some access to public services. So the way in which elites are able to control land is clearly critical to controlling the rents that are generated in urban areas. Land, in my experience, is one of the hardest areas to research because it is so dangerous, because it has been so captured by elites who generate a flow of resources uh, uh, for themselves and for their own personal benefit. There has been increasing interest in um, land value capture. Land value capture really seems to me to be an idea whose time has come. And I think that is cre clearly critical if we're going to address some of the urban developmental challenges because we need to create a flow of funds that local authorities can benefit from. But there's some other really interesting issues. For the people who live in a place like this, perhaps, it's not so much that they need to have Nairobi County with a flow of resources to redistribute. That is certainly part of what they need. But these people are also interested in thinking about new ways in which we could do titling. I was very struck by some work Brookings were doing a few years ago around public asset corporations, around publicly held land, publicly owned land that is managed by consortia and stakeholders. There's work in Namibia around the Flexible Land Tenure Act, an attempt to find ways of titling land that is appropriate to very low income informal settlement dwellers 
who may not um, be able to either afford or benefit from individual titles. So the titling story is an idea which really could benefit from more creative engagements from economics. Fascinatingly, before I move on to my final challenge, the, the payback on these flats is quite extraordinary. You basically invest about 360,000 and you get 100,000 a year. So you have a payback period of less than four years. Now, surely, surely, given that scale of income generation, we could find a better solution than this. And this, for the most part, involves a small family. Often the kids are sent back to relatives in the rural areas. So maybe a couple living in 10 square meters, sharing services with other people on the same floor. These are primarily informal workers in a proximate industrial area. Whoops. So, the final challenge I wanted to throw at you is a challenge that is a real curiosity to me. And that is, it is very common, it is commonplace now to have a whole discourse around the, the lack of structural transformation in African cities. I'm laughing because I'm so delighted that you and you either have taken on this challenge. So representations of African cities as being in deficit, as being consumption cities, as failing, failing to modernize the economic growth story. And I'm not dismissing those because they clearly come out of an analysis of global data that is rigorously tested and, and uh, assessed prior to being analyzed. But at, at the same time, I have a real, a real question mark in my own mind, because as Kunal referenced, I spend a lot of time learning from low income households and low income organizations. I try and really embed myself in their lives when it's possible to travel, which of course has not been in COVID times. But when I do that, what do I observe? I observe a lot of people doing activities which I think are productive, making furniture, um, improving housing, creating food, food processing, uh, doing urban agriculture and doing processing around urban agriculture, rebuilding cars, making clothes, refitting clothes, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are neighborhoods in which there is a, a multitude of economic activities. This is uh, actually another area from Nairobi. I can talk more in the questions about this area and how it's developed, but it's not short of economic activity. That's my point. It's really not short of economic activity. So the question is, how do you reconcile this reality that there is a lot of economic activity at the very local level, some of which even by conservative standards should be called productive? Um, but at the same time, there's this bigger narrative about failure of transformation. Housing, very briefly, is one of the things that people see very differently in the story. So if you go back some years, micro enterprise agencies often refused to lend for housing. It was not a productive activity. It was a consumption activity. And then they spent a bit of time in places like this. And they realized that if you have a room from which to do your tailoring with a concrete floor, with safe areas to keep your goods, and somewhere nice to receive your customers, you absolutely earn more value. You add value to your skills as a tailor. So then they began to, to, um, to see housing a bit differently. And I was reading one of these articles actually about consumption cities, and it talked about real estate development as being a tradable good. So that entered into the production side. So housing for me is a real illustration of how Economists have viewed this differently and arguably failed to capture the real value of housing to people who are seeking to secure their living, look after their families, build their livelihoods and living in these low income areas. So my excitement in this work and this broader engagement on through the seminar is to really challenge the economists who are listening to think differently about urban economics to hopefully be drawn in to some of the challenges, some of the contradictions that I have raised, to embrace complexity, to accept that it, it, it may look like a muddle, but spend time with these people and you will understand. And by understanding, you have the potential to have the insight. I, it's not unusual, I think, for us all to recognize what our disciplines our disciplines can do and what they can't do. And of course, economists must be modest about the boundaries to their discipline but they must also embrace collaboration with other disciplines. I think that to me is really where you see econo urban economics begin to grow. And then I think finally, there are many, uh, there are many recommendations, you know, urban sanitation to be frank is an example of recommendations. The recommendations in the case of sanitation about how valuable it is and how much governments would save and they invested more, but governments don't take that up. So why is that? 
How can we improve the scholarship that we do so that it is taken up? And how can we make sure that when recommendations are taken up, they don't fail? So I guess my final request is that we are reflective in what we produce as scholars. And we really think about how to take scholarship beyond the academic frontier into policy and practice and programming. And we make sure that we follow up when that is the case. And we understand when it succeeds and we understand when it fails. So thank you for giving me this time. These are all the challenges that I wanted to throw out at you on the 1st of February. Thank you. Let me now pass, pass to Michael. Thank you, Diana. Michael, over to you. Can you see my screen? It's yes. Good. All right, uh, thanks, Kunal, and, and thanks, Diana, for the you know you know interesting talk as 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 well. I have ten minutes, and I'll I'll try to do and uh, yeah. But you raised a lot of issues here, and uh, what I'll do is I'll just pick and choose, and I'll, I'll focus on on two of them, all right. So the first thing I'll talk about will be organization and in informalization, because what we are this casting here today, which is urban poverty, has some lateral roots. And one of the roots is actually the issue of organization and then what you call it, and then, you know, informalization as well. So, I'll talk more about that just to set the, the scene. And then also I'll talk about what I've termed some somewhat attempts, because yes, there, 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 there is a lot about urban poverty, but there is some attempt also to pay attention to urban poverty. And in you know trying to do that, what actually happens is that the issues that you have raised about poverty measurement, about the definitional you know, issues have to be dealt with. Otherwise, there is no way we can pay attention to you know, this. But here, let me say that many of these are actually country specific. And so they are not that you know, general in that, in that Okay, so, so I'll try and look at this, the, these two issues briefly, and then we can have time to discuss them as well. So let, let, let me start with urbanization and what you call the informalization. So yes, the, the, there are many folks moving from the you know, rural areas into the urban areas, but one would ask, why do they move into the urban, what do you call it, areas? And one of the factors is that many of them would want decent jobs in this case. But when they get into the urban areas, one, there are no jobs for, for, for them. And then two, the urban areas are also not prepared for them. So you did talk about the issue of sanitation and all the other things that come with it. So what actually happens is that these folks will have to survive. And what do they do? What they do is to tend to informal work in, in this case. So if you look at many of the urban areas, you find seven, eight, nine out of 10 people working as informal workers in, in this case. So let me throw some light on informal work here. And here I'll draw on uh, a book uh, project we are working on here at UNU wider just to show some more light. What we've done is we have a set of a, a set of the developing uh, countries and then we have attempted to categorize informal work into lower tier and then upper tier. 
And we do this for both wage and for self, you know, employment as well. But if, if you look at the, the table, the, the, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, if you look at Ghana, Mali, Nigeria, and then Tanzania and Uganda, what you find is that these countries are dominated by lower tier informal work, those in the self-employment category in this case. And this is, and this is more, Okay. And, and uh, this is more in the urban areas. And if you, if you do compare this to say Latin, what you call America, you don't see this. And then to even a larger extent, what you call Asia as well, you will not find the, these, uh, you know. Uh, okay. But that is not all. all. So we, we had, what you call it, the access to panel the data, and we looked at the transition as well. So if someone is at the lower tier informal self-employed, does he move up to say upper tier and then go up again to say the you know, former? And what we find is that there is a lot of persistence there. So we don't even see this. So those who find themselves in this lower tier are, are, are at a dead end. So they are there and don't move you know, over the years as, as, as well. What, what does this mean? It means that largely we have many informal workers, low productivity, lower what you call the incomes. And just as you said, coupled with the very high cost of living in the urban areas, they be, be become poor. And so to a, you know, a larger extent, what, what has been done is, is that there is a lot of work trying to explain how we can enhance the productivity of you know, informal workers, be it in the you know, urban areas as, as, as well. So this is something we would have to take into consideration over here. The other thing I would talk about is trying to deal with some of the, what you call the issues you did raise is what I call the somewhat attention. So if you look at the data sets, it's quite clear that urban poverty is going up and then what you call the rural poverty is actually coming down. So, I mean, many of the data says that I have, you know, we, we've looked at, show that. And the issue is also that urban poverty is very visible as well, all right? So there is a somewhat, what you call it, attention there. And there is that political will to also deal with, 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 with it. And one of the direct re responses has been in the area of social protection. So there are many cases where you've had cash uh, transfers, which are really rural based, being transferred to urban, what you call it, areas in, in, the, in this case. And there are cases of this in Cameroon, Mozambique, Ghana, and then Kenya. Kenya even has what you call a public works program as well, and then Niger and you know all that. But one thing I would want to pay attention to is, is this: there are there are bigger issues of the design and the implementation of these cash transfers in the urban areas, and in you know trying to do that, what needs to be done in order to do this is to pay attention to many of the issues that you have raised. And so these things tend to be country specific in a way, but for it to be done, they have to pay attention to. It. And one of, one of the key components is this. I mean, uh, uh, trying to adopt a rural PMT into the urban setting. 
So if you if you are in the what do you call the rural area, you are able to identify those who are what do you call it poor using a proxy means test. All right, but the issue is this: if you cannot use the same approach in identifying the poor in the you know rural area in the urban area as well. It, it just doesn't work. And we've had many, many, what you call the experience of that. I mean, a very good example is Ghana when they were trying to expand the cash transfer into the urban areas. Yes, they did use the you know, rural P and T. And what happened was that they couldn't find any work. So what this tells is you is that urban poverty is very different from you know, rural poverty in a way. And in order to deal with this, you would need to engage with many of the things that you did raise here. And in the case of Ghana, I know Stephen Deverox, uh, Ose, you know, Costa, and some other folks did some good work trying to explain how urban poverty is, how do we, measure it within the urban, what do you call it, context? What are the main challenges and what are the way forward in this case? So many other things you have raised in a way, yes, although country specific, but the, 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 there are things that some attention have been paid to in, 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 in this case. And then there are other issues. So. You don't just identify those who are poor in the urban areas in this case. What you do is that the urban cash transfer should also work. And so one should understand the nature and the geography of the urban poor as well. In some urban areas, you would find them in one, what you call a place. So they are concentrated in you know, a place. In some urban areas, they are all over the, the you know, urban area. In some places, they move from one area to the other. So, so th these are things that one would have to appreciate. And in trying to appreciate that, the things you, you, you have raised needs to be you know, looked at. So there are bigger issues of targeting, enrollment, portability, and, and you know, all that, that comes in, into play when we want to pay attention to urban poverty. And then also, just as I said, I mean, most of the work, this is not, this, there is a lot of heterogeneity here. And so most of the work is actually country case studies. And so just, just as I said, the work by the, the diverse and go look, look at Ghana and some other things. But, in an you know, attempt to, to, to pay attention to urban poverty, some of the issues are actually engaged. Yes, I do agree that there is a need to you know, work together. And I, I know the work in say a place like Ghana, the, uh, the, uh, the work by what do you call this, uh, Stephen the Averix uh, the, uh, has other folks involved in, in this case. So there were folks from the ge geography side, from the political science and, and you know, what we call the development, you know, economists as well being, you know, involved in, 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 in you know, all. So, so it, there's a lot in there, but I, I'll say that these are issues that are being dealt with, but I bet at the country level, because otherwise, the the you know efforts in you know trying to combat urban poverty will not work in in the, in this case. So let me end 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 here. And just off my head, I I, I wanted to say that yes, how would work in the ACRC in a way help to push some of these things that we are uh, thinking about. I think you did mention that, but it, 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 it would be great to throw some more light on what the ACRC work 
will uh, help us to you know understand in in this regard yeah. many things uh, thanks very much michael i think actually what you said complements very well um what diana also said it, in the way economists can try and look at some of these issues around special cash transfers to urban areas around informality and so on and uh, maybe Diana can come back to the end, especially on the question on African cities and how African cities can, the research consortium can contribute to some of these issues that both Diana and, and you have discussed. Uh, Diana, there's several questions here in the chat. And I'm going to first start with uh, somebody who actually works with us in African cities, uh, in with the really wider, in Harare, in our Sartre transformation research. That's Mofundo Milo. And Mofundo, I'm going to try and unmute you. And you might ask your question live if you wish to, or even, and also perhaps put your video camera on. Go ahead. Yeah, Bahmud, if you can, if you are, I think you're unmuted, if you want to go ahead with your question. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's much more, um, uh, I mean, a reflection really about, um, uh, I, th I think the interesting, um, a question that um, um, Diana was talking about with regards to the issue of land, particularly that, I mean, when you come to Harare, you see that uh, she was talking about the complications around, um, I mean, issues to do with, I mean, with managing land. And when you see on the urban, peri I mean, on the urban periphery in, Al in Harare, you see that um, a land tenure has been politicized. So there's a continuation of uh, people uh, remaining, um, they are not given the tenure to control the land as a means of, of political control, which then exacerbates this whole issue of, um, I mean, of urban poverty. And then when you then you look at the issue of, um, of I mean, of um, corruption with, the, I mean, with regards to land. I think just last year, the state of Harare tried to do um, a land bank, and they failed to do it primarily because uh, the whole discussion around the, the land has been so politicized, which then creates this partial unruliness that we see in um, in, in the state of Harare. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Dan, if that's okay, can we take a couple of more questions? Because just want to make sure we cover. Yeah, okay. And Natalie Rothwell, you had a question. I'm going to try again, unmute you. And you can ask a question directly to Diana, if you wish. Diana, yeah, I was really interested in what you said about um, some of the more positive aspects of African cities um, being hidden. Um, I'm doing a PhD actually on housing and data from a gender perspective. So I'm really interested in kind of how you bring out some of those more positive narratives in, in terms of measurement, um, thinking of indicators as well as other statistical frameworks. So we're not just reinforcing the idea that African cities are negative rather than also positive environments. Thanks very much, Natalie. Uh, Diana, should we take a third question or would you like to answer these two questions first? They're very different canals, so maybe I should go ahead and answer them. You know, um, sure. Mufundu, I, as you said, it's not a question, it's a, a more of a comment. And I would agree that I think Harari, in a sense, though, is particularly interesting because for so long, the government really, um, you know, controlled options in, in, in it stopped people developing land on the periphery. It was very fast to control informal settlements. Arguably, it had a very strong modernization narrative. So you had to be able to afford this concrete block house, these full services in order to be an urban citizen. And that I think um, created all kinds of challenges and indeed a huge housing backlog, uh, which in a sense burst the banks once the ZANU PF government really raised issues of land ownership. And it created this context in which, as, as you alluded to, that, that people who could control the farms around Harare could sell that farmland and create housing land. So you've got now a, a really a very fascinating situation in Harare around land development and clearly a lot of challenges on the city council that desperately need to acquire the resources to put in the bulk infrastructure such that this housing development can be safe and secure. And you know that to me is absolutely what characterizes urban areas that land gets value from public investment and that value is appropriated to private gain. So clearly that needs a very astute and capable local government to manage that contradiction. And I would argue we really don't talk about that contradiction enough and how we can manage it. 
I think a very different question, Natalie, around data collection. And I work very closely with Slum Shack Dwellers International, particularly, who've done a lot around community data collection. I would argue in my experience of doing research, and I'm not sure what your potential is for doing research with women working in the informal sector, that you know, really spending time with them to understand the ways in which they create, uh, they try and improve their livelihoods, the constraints they face, because they're real constraints. Um, I absolutely recognize the concerns about a very positive narrative in a context in which people struggle a lot, but also the strategies they have to overcome those constraints, both within their household, their neighborhood, and more widely. That has always been, been really uh, significant to me in terms of my own learning experience, that dedicating sufficient time to understand people's realities as they see it, and spending time with them experiencing their work as they go ahead. I'm sure Kunal will want me to mention Wego's work. Uh, Wego work very closely with you and you wider and absolutely have done amazing things around women's work, bringing together, bringing to light the struggles they face and the constraints that they have to overcome. Thanks, Dinah. Uh, there is a question from Almond Bandalko. Uh, Almond, should I unmute you and you can try and see if you can ask your question? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jenna, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I just want to understand your recommendation on the multi-dimensional poverty index and uh, the feasibility of deploying that in a, you know, in sort of diverse context. I, I think one of the things that you mentioned is the challenge in terms of the measurements of poverty. You know, are there any efforts to kind of harmonize them? And is that feasible in your own, uh, based on your own experience? And what are the implications for policy? It's a kind of different questions, but yeah. Yeah, thanks. And Diana, there's also a question which I, which I find very interesting, I felt. There's a question from Gabriel who says that we focus too much on urban poverty uh, and we don't really look at the middle class who are very important in making productive investments or so on. How would you respond to that question of uh, making sure that we also keep in mind those who are absolutely important in, in terms of economic transformation, especially the middle class, perhaps? Did you want to respond to these two questions? Okay, two very different questions. Um, I think I, I would, uh, with reference to the, um, the multidimensional poverty index. So I think they've certainly done important work in challenging the way in which we understand poverty and in trying to broaden out our understanding of poverty into deprivation of assets, as well as um, a lack of income poverty. But at the same time, if you're trying to take their work into the urban context, questions arise. Let me just pick one of the elements of their index, uh, drinking water. So, you know, their, their um, measure is actually the JMP measure, <laughs> the, the, or a JMP measure. The household source of drinking water is not safe, or safe drinking water is 30 minute or longer walk from home. Now, that's one really important measure of lack of access to water. You know, water is not safe, or you have to walk a long way to get water. A, a further measure in an urban context is that you can't afford enough water and water is excluded from uh, the, the food basket, although the WHO have a measure of, of adequate consumption of water. The WHO measure of water in a non-emergency situation is 50 litres per person per day. In an emergency situation, I think it's 20 or 23 litres per person per day. Now, if you have very little money and you're buying water from a kiosk or a private vendor or your neighbor, you are unlikely, I would say, to be able to afford that scale of water, except in countries where there is an effective subsidy. I mean, Nairobi is actually somewhere, in my observation, where water is relatively cheap, but that's often not the case. So I would say that the, the MPI has gone some way to helping us understand the measurement challenges, but has not gone far enough really to, to understand the realities of urban households and how we can think about overcoming them. Um, maybe moving on to the, the second question. You know, I would, I would really agree with the question that we need to think about this without a kind of um, a poor non-poor categorization. Um, there are clearly many degrees of that and clearly generating improvements in livelihoods 
has to recognize that, that there's a continuum in the income scale. Um, you know, when we have 60% plus of the urban population living in informal settlements, the so-called slum population, then clearly a lot of those are not super poor. Some of those are absolutely managing to cope, are finding ways to well-educate their children. Their children may be going to college. They may be trying to accumulate assets to secure a little bit of land on the periphery of the city, et cetera, et cetera. So we do indeed need to understand these households. I think potentially your question also related to the people, the low middle income groups. And, and I mean, certainly if I look at what I've observed in Africa, in Asia and Latin America, those have become increasingly significant groups. So absolutely, if we're thinking about urban prosperity, we need to look at those groups. We need to understand how they operate politically, how they put pressure on local government to improve services to themselves and trigger improvements for other people. And also how they can help to support growing a growing um, industrial base, be it around services or around uh, potentially goods that could also be exported. So I absolutely agree, those are all really important characteristics. Just very briefly, Canal, I would also say, you know, one of the things, some of the more interesting work on cities that has gone on recently and has drawn in economists has been work to understand peri-urban developments, sometimes of these lower middle income, middle income households who are unable to afford to buy land in well-located areas. So they identify land on the periphery and they begin to develop those areas. And one of the most fascinating things about cities is understanding that spatiality. So looking at, you know, how can you potentially generate a slightly more prosperous area? Do you need to try and invest in transport services that could be financially viable because of the scale of people traveling and might, um, might provide nodes of development on the periphery with very positive benefits for low income households living around those areas because they're opportunities to diversify their livelihoods. So I, I, I would agree with the sentiment of the comment and indeed your comment for now, that chat really for me, understanding how to progress cities has to be about understanding how to progress the well-being and prosperity of all residents in cities. Um, thanks, Diana. Um, I'm going to let, there's again, several questions which I probably don't have the time to get, get, get into, but there's a question from Ivan Turov, which kind of goes into this the work we are doing on social transformation in African cities. And so perhaps you want, uh, Ivan, you want to ask the question to Diana? And then I also had a question for you, Diana, too. Go ahead, Ivan. Um, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciated Diana's um, uh, rich insights from sort of grounded understanding of what's actually happening and showing that there is a lot of uh, enterprise and indeed economic dynamism uh, in, in African cities. So the question is, you know, what, what is constraining its, its productivity? What's constraining investment? What is holding back incomes? Uh, and in particular, what can governments do? Because the political economy is often unfavorable. You know, I think we have to be clear about what the agenda is and not overcomplicate. Uh, the task, given the problems of, of weak capabilities of African local governments. Mm. And Diana, just my one question to you. So this is the question that, that Michael actually asked specifically, that what would your, be your wish list on African cities delivering on challenges we see in terms of research? And how do you think Uni Wider can contribute to this, uh, to this research program in, in the kind of challenges you set, especially for economies to deal with some of the Questions of measurement, the questions around understanding politics and power, understanding the importance of land, the forest. Uh, so all these issues where you think economists can actually try and contribute. What would you, your wish list be in this regard? That's my uh, last question for you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ivan and, and Kunal. I feel I should also leave enough time for Michael to come in and have a maybe a couple of minutes at the end. I think. Um, Ivan, I think your question is a, a very real one, and um, I feel I'm only give it, going to give it a partial answer. I would say, for me, one of the most critical things is to think about how to deliver essential services. So think about how to deliver water. I mean, it is terrifying how often pipes are, uh, water is not running in pipes. If you look at uh, the data, the data we looked at this in the WRI study. So if anyone is interested, you can you can go on the World Resources Institute website and find out this working paper. So we documented how how often water is not in pipes, and it is terrifying in African cities. 
Um, I think also thinking about ways to expand energy access, be, let people access energy, reliable energy, energy that electricity that 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 um, uh, is a reliable source uh, is also seriously important. If I when I think about the people I know who are struggling to put in place micro enterprises or uh, even to ensure that household incomes are well used in order that they are not super vulnerable, in order that they have money to send their kids to college, et cetera, et cetera. You know, some of those expenditures are often some of the most critical. And I would maybe not always local government, often it's utilities or national governments, but I would say that, you know, improving service delivery is really important. And from where I sit, being realistic, this is the international agencies, not just the local ones, being realistic about what the data tells you, because too often, I think, we've set up these measurements, I tried to explain, that don't give us the information we need and doesn't trigger change um, and reform. So I would start there. And then I would also start with the quality of the dialogue. Um, I think in my experience, where you have a local government with mid-level and high-level officials who make an effort to talk to people, to reach out to people, to visit low-income areas, then you get a better quality of governance. I was very struck um, not long before the pandemic happened in Bulawayo about sitting in a low-income community with the housing officer and the low-income community explaining how someone had come saying they were from the council and, and essentially coercing this informal neighbourhood to pay them in order to be allowed to remain and not being evicted. And in fact, that was completely fraudulent. But this community have quite a good relationship with the local authority. So they could check this out quite easily with lower costs. So where local government has that has that ability, then I think you have potential to improve situations. Um, so I would start there if you ask me, but I'm conscious also that there are others who are better qualified than me to answer that question. I think, you know, in a sense, um, Kunal, you asked the question about what my aspirations are for African cities. Let me just find it, because I think it's just jumped. It was, it, did you put it in the chat or not? Um, no, okay. So. I think that for me, it's really a matter of thinking about the quality of work we do um, and then bringing together a multidisciplinary perspective. So, you know, that's why I've been so excited, Kunal and Michael, about the work that you're doing in Newer and New Wider. Um, I think, you know, you have such expertise around thinking through issues to do with structural transformation. And at the same time, you will be exposed, not really through the work of myself, but the work of our colleagues and indeed the work of some of the African experts who've been trying to challenge and drive through this process for decades and setting up this dialogue whereby you have a chance to understand the world as they see it and they have a chance to understand the models that you're using, the things that they help them inform a new understanding of the constraints they face. That to me is where we really see traction by bringing together experts, the frontiers of their field and putting them in dialogue with each other. And I could have read, read, immediately see some of this conversation happening at an uptake meeting we had recently, not excitement about uh, economics yet, but excitement from one of the people working on housing reform in Accra about the chance to engage with, set, with, with the frameworks of political settlements and understanding what that level of political analysis might offer to their strategies. So for me, African cities is a chance to take scholars and practitioners and program experts at the front of their field and put them into a structured conversation, one with each other, and hopefully contribute to nudging forward the reform frontier through that, that structured conversation and through a commitment to achieve urban reform. Thanks, Diana. I'm going to ask the same question to Michael now. Actually, Michael, uh, since you're, you're the one that leads the, our work on African cities, uh, on transformation, uh, economic transformation. What would you want to see to have in this program that can answer by this of the question that Diana raised at the beginning in her presentation? So what's your wish list? What's your aspiration here? Uh, we can't hear you. So, so, so. Sorry, I, I was uh, muted, all right. So, so I mean, so we, 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 one thing that uh, one would want to see is, is, is to be able to, to be, is to be able to engage. I mean, so, so the work we are, we are doing at ACRC has different 
facets, right? So the issue of the, what do you call the city as, you know, a system, the, pol the, the pol political settlement the, uh, lens and then all that. I mean, how well can we be able to connect this one to another in, you know, able to come up with the, you know, what do you call it? The, you know, the, you know, a relevant policy complex problems, all right? So, so that, that, is, that is one thing I would want to see. How, because we, we, we're just getting off the ground, but how best, you know, can we be able to put all these ideas together in order to generate the, the uh, you know, the uh, priority complex problems that would uh, come up? I think these are things that I, I, I do look, look up for. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, I think it's all very, it's very clear, I think for our, all of us, that there's a lot of exciting research to be done here. And Dan has put some wonderful questions for economists uh, in this audience for us to think about. I, I think just to end on this very, very quickly, I think there are two area, uh, issues that you brought up, which I think economists haven't been able to grapple, up, grapple with very well. One is politics and power. I mean, anybody who goes to any city in the global south, they know that land is political, deeply political, and land is contested. And we have to use the power and politic lens to understand land. Uh, and certainly also the way land is organized in cities. Um, it's very important to go outside mainstream economic tools. And I think this is where perhaps the political economy work that we're doing in African cities and elsewhere and the work that you know, we, I've also done, it's really important to bring in because mainstream economics, I, in my view, cannot answer these sort of questions. The second thing I think is where there's a big problem in economics is that we don't really have a good understanding of separate economics. So most of our thinking about economic, economics is about wage labor, wage, wage employment. And how to measure self-employment, Dan, as you mentioned, it's very challenging. And we don't yet have proper me methods to understand self-employment, which is the dominant mode of employment in most urban areas in Africa and even elsewhere. So these are areas which I think we need to do better in economics. And it's really great that you have posed some wonderful challenges for us to think about. And hopefully in UNI wider, we can keep on working on this in collaboration with others and try and address the challenges as we go forward. So thanks so much, Diana, for your time. And thanks, Michael. And we look forward to, to more work in the African Cities Research Center, which I think some, uh, Chris Dodden, who is a communications manager in Africa Cities, put the link to the program's website so others can take a look at what's, uh, what's happening there. And I conclude here by saying that we have a, a second webinar in the 2020 series on, uh, on Tuesday, March 8th, the Women's Day Special, to be provided by Ashwini Deshpande and Yankee Peters and with its work. So look forward to seeing many of you there in that particular web in the webinar in about a month's time. Thanks very much, all of you, and take care.